Good morning and welcome to Park Road Baptist Church. We know that it is difficult in these days. We are less and less comfortable to be together and we can see that this morning by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people in the room. Um, and we know that the rest of you are out there. I see you signing on and greeting one another and it is good to be together in this place in this way. It is um, rough out there these days in the aftermath of uh, gatherings that we know occurred for Christmas and New Year's and making life tough on everybody trying to figure out how to continue to be together in safe ways and our COVID task force team is continuing to talk about that um, in, in what we will do in the coming weeks. We felt uh, that the very few people we have here today are safe and the rest of you we are glad that you're joining in either live or watching this sometime later. Let me mention a couple of things to you. Dan has set up our backpack snack program in the youth building. Um, all of the food has not come in yet, and he's hoping to pick that up tomorrow. But if you'll go ahead and go online to the Sign Up Genius or get in touch with Dan and your family come and pack uh, backpack snacks at your own convenience, if you'll let us know when you want to come pack, We'll even turn the heat on for you in the youth building so you won't be cold while you're doing it. So let us know when you might could come and spend some time getting uh, backpack snacks together for our uh, children that are still in need of food over weekends, and we look forward to that. Our youth will meet tonight um, in all the safe ways that they do from 5 to 6, and uh, Jamie will be leading that. So we look forward to that this evening. We welcome to worship this morning Whit Blunt, who is the director of bands at Myers Park High School. Uh, we have a trumpet uh, trio for our offertory that Mark is accompanying on organ, and uh, we are grateful to have Whit with us today. He uh, has been a part of our family for many years as both of our boys went through the Myers Park High School band program and a mentor to Bennett, and it's been good on, on Bennett's last Sunday here before he goes back to school uh, to have uh, one more round of trumpets for a while. This morning as we turn our attention to worship, it is Baptism of the Lord Sunday, and so we don't have the baptistry full of water today. No one is going to walk through the water and be baptized. Though we do have uh, at least one person out there that's waiting for the pandemic to be over so we can set a baptism date. And even as we discuss that today, perhaps some others of you have considered walking through the waters of baptism. So today we will talk about the baptism of Jesus. Uh, just a few months ago, I was doing some cleaning out in my office and I came across a baptism paragraph and it uh, when someone is baptized at our church we ask them to write a paragraph that begins with this sentence today I'm being baptized because and just write us a paragraph why are you being baptized today and they choose the person to read that paragraph I got to read this paragraph uh, I don't even know how many years ago I think Bennett was in the third grade third grade when he was baptized and I had kept this in my desk drawer and I pulled it out and some cleaning out, and I could not bring myself to throw it away. Russ was in the water with him to baptize him, and I read, I'm being baptized today because I would like to become a follower of Jesus. I want to be baptized because everything is starting to make sense about following, understanding, and learning about being a follower of Jesus and what that means. Starting to make sense. Yeah. And we spend the rest of our lives trying to understand what that means. An ancient confession of the Christian church has been Jesus is Lord. That is the confession in the baptism waters. It's in the confession that we walk with on our journey that Jesus is Lord. So in our litany today, that is your response. Jesus is Lord. Just as Jesus was baptized, we too are baptized into a renewed life, confessing Jesus is Lord. In this new life, we discover the dignity 
of being human. Amidst this kind of recognition, we claim Jesus is Lord. In remembering the baptism of Jesus, we join with God who joined with us in a commitment to renew the world. If we are indeed going to do our part to make the world better, more loving and forgiving, more full of hope, more active for peace, then we will need all of the power that comes with our bold proclamation, Jesus is Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather on this day after a very long week of being glued to our TVs, watching in horror the divide among the people of this nation. Though it's hard to claim surprise, we know that you are accustomed to seeing the chaos of your people. We just aren't quite as accustomed to it as you are. You call us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. And so now in this hour, we turn our attention toward you. In this hour, we ask for courage to speak and act for justice. In this hour, we ask for wisdom to work for peace. In this hour, we ask for compassion that we might live in grace justice, peace, grace. These words are your language. Help us to speak your language, which is always a language of love. We pray this in the name of the one that we claim as Lord and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first hymn this morning that we will not sing, obviously, but that Mark will play for us, is entitled, I Was There to Hear Your Borning Cry. The first verse reads, I was there to hear your borning cry. I'll be there when you are, were old. I rejoice the day you were baptized to see your life unfold. I was there when you were but a child with a faith to suit you well. I'll be there in case you wander off and find where demons dwell. The next couple of verses take you through the life story of someone on this journey of faith when you found the wonder of the word in the middle ages of your life and it comes back to, I'll be there as I have always been with just one more surprise, a word that God is indeed always with us. May it be so.
I was talking to Leslie in the office a day or two after the insurgency at the Capitol building, and we were both trying, rather unsuccessfully, to name what we were feeling. There was some anger, to be sure, but that wasn't really the pervasive sentiment. On the way home that day, I realized that, for me, it was a deep and profound sense of emptiness. The realization that the divisions in our country had come to this. I'm still feeling some of that, still processing the events of the past week, as I'm sure you are as well. During our time of confession, I would invite you to consider the hard question of how you might have voluntarily or involuntarily contributed in some way to the divisiveness and what you might do to help restore unity. Let us keep silence together. The words that I am about to pray are part of the prayer that was offered by Senate Chaplain Barry Black shortly before 4 a.m. on the morning after the attack on the Capitol building and immediately following the conclusion of the Senate session confirming the electoral votes. Hear these words as we pray. Lord of our lives, we deplore the desecration of the United States Capitol building, the shedding of innocent blood, the loss of life, and the quagmire of dysfunction that threatened our democracy. These tragedies have reminded us that words matter and the power of life and death is in the tongue. Lord, you have helped us remember that we need to see in each other a common humanity that reflects your image. Use us to bring healing and unity to our hurting and divided nation. Bless and keep us. Drive far from us all the wrong desires. Incline our hearts to do your will and guide our feet on the path of peace. Amen. And know that even as you seek in some small ways to bring healing and unity to our country, Know that you are loved and you are forgiven, so be at peace.
I will say more about this text during the sermon, so let me simply read to you from the 19th chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. It's the closest thing we have to a history of the early church while Apollos was in Corinth. Apollos was one of the early disciples, a convert of Paul, and helped him establish churches in the Mediterranean world. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? And they replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And Paul said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, Well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized again. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. Into what then were you baptized? You have heard the ancient story. Let us listen now for the word of the Lord. What a week. We've had some difficult days in our 20 years as your pastors. Amy stood in this pulpit the Sunday after 9-11, but this is probably the single most difficult Sunday I have ever stood right here. From this pulpit four years ago, I referenced a seminar in which Amy and I had been invited to participate. The seminar was called The Church in the Age of Donald Trump. Following worship that day, I was politely but forcefully taken to task as if I had announced our participation in a, for, in a forbidden partisanship, you know, the act of preaching as a covert arm of the Democratic Party or something like that. Did you attend a seminar for the church in the age of Obama, I was asked, pointedly? No, I said. Nor for Bill Clinton or George W. Bush, the other presidents representing our tenure as your pastors, the planners of that seminar apparently felt no such seminar had ever before been warranted. What one man had brought to the cultural and political landscape of American life, at least in recent memory, was completely new. Wednesday's sad insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, another day that will live in infamy, was the culmination of four years of unrelenting assault on the norms and conventions of American democracy as it has been known, and an erosion of the very fabric of truth. That attack, which was as predictable as it was deplorable, confirmed the deepest instincts and the worst fears that have been shared by every one of our ministerial colleagues as well as all the voices, theological and historical, the voices of wisdom we have trusted for our two decades in pastoral ministry. Nothing like this has ever happened in the history of the United States. Let us pray we never witness it again. So what does the pastor of a theologically progressive Christian church say at the culmination of such a presidency? which may very well be summarized in the history books by one date, January 6, 2021. Should I speak of truth and what can happen to a nation when it can no longer identify fact from fantasy? Should I speak of the power and the danger of the use of words to inspire and to incite 30 years of talk radio, hate media, the insidious poison of texts and tweets? Should I speak of the Christian demand for character and integrity in individual and public life and the hypocrisy of a church that turns its back on its own preaching? Should I speak of the essential role of the church to call out injustice, racial and economic to name bigotry and intolerance for what it is? 
And could I say any of that and not be accused of partisan pandering? God forbid that I should stand as some will today and try to stand with the biblical prophet Nathan who dared to call out the infidelity of the leader of a nation. Now I'm not asking for your pity today, though I have prayed long and hard over what to say to a diverse congregation on a Sunday that is positioned tenuously between insurrection and inauguration, between failure and future. No, I am not asking for your pity, but my colleagues who announced that seminar four years ago that the church was facing an unprecedented challenge were not wrong. Wednesday was undeniable proof of that. So what does the pastor of a theologically progressive Christian church say today? There is so much that could be said, so much that needs to be said. I think we'll talk about baptism. The church calendar names today Baptism of the Lord Sunday. For 20 years, I have been consistently surprised and inspired by a lectionary of prescribed biblical texts that time and time again have managed to offer just the right word for just the right day. The lectionary was originally conceived in 1969, a three-year cycle of text first selected by a Roman Catholic scholars group. It was last summer that I chose the narrative from the book of Acts that I just read for you. Last summer, I chose it for today. The Apostle Paul is in Corinth, one of the cosmopolitan centers of ancient Asia, where earlier he had established one of the first Christian churches there. Those Corinthian converts were among the first followers of this way of Jesus that was sweeping the Mediterranean world. The text calls them disciples. And Paul's question to them caught my attention all those months ago. I had no idea how appropriate they would be for this difficult day until I watched in horror as that frenzied mob stored, stormed the U.S. Capitol on Wednesday. Many of the banners were repulsive enough, but two of them turned my stomach, broke my spirit. Five people were killed in this murderous madness, and many of the president's mob seem to have had equal, if divided, loyalties. One banner made it clear, hoisting two names in equal size, two names in power and pride, Jesus and Trump. Another, a bright yellow flag pointed prophetically to the church in the age of Donald Trump as the chosen weapon of the one who carried that banner, a mad and misguided missionary marched against U.S. soil proclaiming, Jesus saves. And Paul said to the disciples, into what then were you baptized? Into what were you baptized? Park Road Baptist Church was founded in 1950 as a Southern Baptist congregation, a mission enterprise of Myers Park and Pritchard Memorial Baptist Churches. The founding pastor self-identified as an evangelist. Years later, Charlie Milford would smile cynically as he remembered, I came to save souls like firebrands from the burning. I've heard Charlie say that many times. In those days, baptism was understood in that light. Probably a mix of sanctimony and superstition, water, enough of it to drown any unrepentant sinner, was salvation. Immersion quenched the fires of eternal damnation. Now, I don't have time to recount this morning what was probably a 20-year conversion of that pastor and much of his congregation but that movement, which has been described as the liberation of a congregation, included the conversion of the theology and the practice of baptism. 
While not written into the actual bylaws of this church, this congregation adopted a policy that it has long called non-compulsory baptism, which encourages baptism, but remarkably for a Baptist church, does not require it for church membership. Now, I can tell you more about this history and theology, but this morning, just a summary of what I have come to believe is the thoroughly Baptist instinct behind our not very Baptist expression of baptism. Baptists have always said that we practice believers' baptism by immersion. That is, rather than infant baptism, when someone has grown and reached enough understanding to choose to be baptized, to choose to be baptized, we dunk our converts. They have to drip dry from one end to the other. It's a beautiful symbol, not just of cleansing, but a symbol of Jesus, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. As I have experienced it in Baptist life, however, what often happens fails the smell test of anything that I think ought to be called believer's baptism. Some fiancé comes to the pastor and says, she says I need to join the church, just tell me what to do. And he gets baptized. The church visitor is ready to take the next step in community and commitment, but honestly not ready yet for baptism, but it's always been required. You know, we're Baptists, so by guilt or fear or by tradition, she has walked through the water. What should be a symbol imbued with spiritual significance, which can be a meaningful symbol for a lifetime of faith, becomes a hollow initiation, the jumping through hoop of ecclesiastical requirement, form over function, conformity over conviction. So Park Road Baptist Church decided years ago to be Baptist enough to risk not looking Baptist at all in this regard. This church chose to separate the conversations about church membership and baptism insisting that when we baptize, it will mean something. Baptism is encouraged, but not required. Having given up any truly sacramental understanding of the practices of faith, that was way too Catholic for our Baptist forebears. Baptism has always been understood in Baptist life, not as a sacrament, but as a symbol, important, rich, meaningful, but a symbol of commitment, not a requirement for salvation. Christians practice baptism in many forms, with infants and with adults, by sprinkling water, by pouring water over your head, in full-bodied immersion. Some traditions, like Quakers, do not baptize at all. Park Road has been Baptist enough over the years to insist that true faith must never be convert, coerced, can never be coerced. And Park Road has been Baptist enough to insist that the priesthood of the individual believer is inviolable. That is, each person has the responsibility and the right to decide when and where and how to make commitments in faith. Not only is there a deeply Baptist instinct in this church's tradition, I believe, but a deeply Christian one as well. Christians have always insisted that baptism signified something meaningful and mysterious, deep and difficult. The earliest converts to the faith studied for a year before going into the water completely naked in an annual Easter ceremony. In those waters, they were asked to confess their faith, sometimes repeating it three times in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when they did so, confessing their faith by saying, Jesus is Lord, they were not just confessing a religious conviction, they were making a pointedly political statement. 
Now, many of you do not want to hear that today, but from the very beginning, if we are honest about our faith, our tradition, our history, from the very beginning, the confession of Christian faith has been a political, subversive act. Jesus is Lord means Caesar is not. Baptism was a public testimony to a commitment to a new way, to a set of convictions that was unlike that of any military allegiance, unlike any allegiance to any economic system, to any structure of human government. In baptisms, in baptism, Christians were saying unequivocally, our faith and hope, our trust and loyalty is in Jesus alone. Not magic, not military, not money, not the Roman emperor, not Donald J. Trump. The sick and sickening Christian nationalism that was on broad display in the bright banners and the angry chants and the misguided mob mentality of a failed insurrection has not only brought the shining hope of democracy to its knees, the Trump insurrection, as it is being called, has also brought the Christian church, the church of Jesus Christ, to a moment of clear decision. To what will we pledge our allegiance? Capitalism? Militarism? Republicanism? Liberalism? Americanism? Into what then were you baptized? The powerful politics of Christian baptism makes it clear and the world needs us to finally fully understand that confession of faith. Jesus is Lord and no other. May it be so. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? God, baptism reminds us of the truth that we are seen, known, loved, and heard. May we be vulnerable enough to believe that truth. Baptism envelops us and nourishes us with a community of people willing to and actively walking the journey of life alongside us. May we have the courage to accept that care. Baptism holds the possibility for curiosity and mystery to refresh and offer hope, hope in the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us. And God of great love, no, ma no matter where we find ourselves this morning, in love, chaos, anger, hope, anxiety, and everywhere else, may the stories we hear and the experiences we share and the courage we hold sustain us throughout all that is and all that is to come. God of the everyday mundane, may we pay attention to the waters among us. The touch of warm water through hand washing, the taste of ice water to quench our thirst, the unique smell of water following a rainstorm, the sound of water in a boiling pot, and the sight of a flowing river and the water of a flowing river. So offer us a reminder of the baptism of the Lord, the baptism of all your people, and the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. Amen. As our trio prepares to play Amazing Grace, let me say a word about this offertory. We have thanked you profusely. I hope you have felt that and known of our great gratitude for how we have finished uh, 2020 financially. Um, and we are well on our way to uh, pledging what we need for 2021, but we are not there yet. We still need about $25,000, and we really have cut all the places that there are to cut over time, and so you know what the biggest expense of our church is, and that is personnel, and that is no uh, underlying, oh my goodness, somebody's got to be cut. It's just to say, if you haven't pledged, please do so. 
If you can pledge some more, please do so. We know these are difficult days and we know that everybody is in a different place financially and with jobs and all that is happening in our world. We just ask you, could ask you to consider uh, how you might help us get that, ex that next $25,000. In the ebb and flow of every church, people come and people go and uh, it, it fluctuates our financial situation and we ask for you all uh, to consider being found faithful in this coming year, just as you have been in all the many years since the beginning of this church. We give thanks for you. May we be found faithful. I needed that after this week. I hope it went deep into your own hearts to hear the beauty of what grace does sound like. Thank you to Witt and to Bennett and to Russ and to Mark for that. Russ, the final word is not ours, but the Lord's. <laughs> it's been that kind of week. It has been. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God give you grace this day to love with all your heart. That you might do justice. To love with all your soul. That you might show mercy. To love with all your mind. That you might walk humbly with your God. As you go into the world this day, dear friends, love the Lord your God with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Thank you.